The Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast, number 147. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. You were like the uh, carrot top of interviewers. Wow, how disappointing was that question? You did not just ask me that. That's a very big question. Never mind, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing the show. Wow, I can't believe it. I, I'm telling you, I'm I'm hooked. Nick, 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 Nick. Yeah, he's so awesome. He's um, so a good friend of mine. Welcome to another episode of the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. My name's Nick. Very thankful that you're here. There's so many shows that you could pick from to listen to, but you've chosen ours, and I do appreciate it. Give our Instagram some love, if you don't mind. We are at Fan Counters Live. We're just having trouble getting fan conversion to uh, review on iTunes and sign up on Instagram and all that. So if you could help us with that, it would certainly go a long way for the show. So iTunes reviews for Fan Counters and the at Fan Counters Live on Instagram. Uh, to my left this week for another special episode. It's one that I've been waiting for for such a long time because uh, it was a very good, big honor for me to talk to Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow about the show, The New Leave to Beaver. But most often, I was a kid when I watched the show, so I related more to the kids. So when we had a chance to have the Osmond brothers on, Kalina Kiff and Kip Marcus, like just hearing their stories... And I was able to relate a little bit more because I was a kid when they were a kid and all of that. So we have one of the last kids that's going to appear on the show. We found John Snee, finally, and uh, he's our guest today. So to my left is Brian Nelson Jr. You were here last week for Gail Chandler, and now here we are again with John Snee. Yes, we are. And did you notice what I brought with me today? I saw you have the green Leave it to Beaver Jerry Mathers hat. I, I do, and and there's a reason for that. Right before the show, or no, late last night, thinking about today's show, I could not sleep. So you I were very excited. I was pumped. So <laughs> so, well, I I ran into a late night commercial. Okay, and it was five 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 party, and so I <laughs> I called it and I, yeah. So I got a I I I got this blind date. So I gotta like wear this hat, otherwise she won't recognize me. I don't know if you're telling the truth or not. <laughs> five, five, five party. Is that a thing? Are you being serious right now? No. <laughs> I'm like, holy crap. What are you doing to your life? Oh my gosh. I don't think there's, I don't think there's, there's hotlines for, for such anymore. Uh, there, there probably is if you stay up late enough. <laughs> I have two kids, so I don't see much past 11 these days. Um, so look, there was a survey taken and we're going to do this before we get into our interview for today. It's everybody's favorite segment. And now shocking celebrity news of the week. All right. So we've got some celebrity news for the week. Last week, I talked about some stalkers that were uh, plaguing certain celebrities like Katy Perry and um, Magic Johnson. And this week we have the biggest news story of the week. The president of the United States has covid and I don't want to I don't want to go political on this, but there is a survey that came out, and it has over thirty thousand respondents. So I'm just going to kind of go through the questions and answers for you because thirty thousand is a pretty good sample from random people finding this specific website, which I'll leave unnamed. Um, so Trump fighting COVID, do you have sympathy or not, or do you say he had it coming? Shockingly, sixty six percent of the people that were polled said he had it coming. 34% said they had sympathy. Uh, Trump's COVID diagnosis, do you think it'll help him with voters, Brian, or hurt him? You know, I, that's a tough one. I I think it'll help him. So 38% thought it would help him with voters. 62% said it's going to hurt him. Uh, this is an interesting one. The statement is just this. I'll probably get COVID. Yes or no? What do you think, Brian? We're in Wisconsin, so this is a hotbed right now. The virus is running rampant in our state. Uh, we have all the mask mandates in or in effect, and we've been doing all this social distancing and masking, yet our numbers over the, since the mask mandate are higher than they've ever been before. Do masks work? I don't know. But what do you think? Do you think you're going to get COVID? I don't. I mean, I, I don't want to curse myself by saying that, but, you know, I, I do all the precautions. You know, I... I do what I need to do. I pretty much, I, I do work in the public, so that does, 
you know, that does, does put up, up the, your chance. It does get the risk a little higher. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I also think the numbers are higher too, because I think there's more testing Okay, and more testing gives you more results, giving you higher numbers of positive results. Same survey, same group of people, 31% thought they would get it. 69% said, no, they're not going to get it. Now let's talk about the vaccine. When the COVID vaccine comes out, would you get it? Not right away. So 44% said definitely, 56% said, sorry, I don't trust it. Pretty interesting stats there. Uh, What is the biggest threat to America? Is it racial injustice or COVID? What do you think? Again, that's a tough one. I, I think both of them are highly fueled. Sure. Mm -hmm. And... I, I think that the virus is more of an issue myself. Yeah, 59% of the people agreed with you that thought COVID was the biggest threat. 41% said racial injustice. And I think COVID is more of a short-term threat to the United States. But this racial right. injustice, uh, if we don't get people on the same level and the same playing field, we're just going to have problems for a very, very long time. And I, I certainly hope we can change hearts because this isn't a political thing. It's a... Uh, it's something that is in... It's an American thing. It's, it's in people, though. Right, And right. Y- y- jerks are going to be jerks. You yep. can't stop that. And exactly. um, we can't eliminate all the jerks. You so can't. I don't know that this problem ever goes away, but certainly I hope um, the majority of people get on a more baseline level so that we can all hold hands and f- battle this together. Totally. All right, last one. Better place to live. Would you rather live in the United States or Canada? I would definitely want to live in the United States over Canada. Again, same group of people. 30,000 people took the survey. 36% said United States. 64% say Canada, which is interesting because nobody left to go to Canada after they all said they would when Trump won the election. So yeah, there you go. All right, let's get to today's interview. We have on the show, finally, John, you're here. John Snee from the new Leave it to Beaver. I know it sounds like Hey, we got this guy from this red hot new TV show. No, he was on television uh, 20 years ago, but we have been reuniting the cast. He was the one lone holdout kid besides Troy Davidson, who hasn't been here yet. And uh, we're going to change that today. He's here. John Snee. John Snee is here. What do you remember about John from the show? You're because you, you're a big watcher. Of oh, the- yeah. Yeah. I, I watch like like, I t- you know, I. The shows I, you know, I told John I, I taped all the all the all the shows that I could. Unfortunately for me, though, the the show wasn't. I didn't have the Disney Channel. The Disney Channel was a was a was a pay channel back then. Mm-hmm. And then when it was on, you know, I first started watching it in syndication. The first episode I ever saw was the Thanksgiving one. And the first thing I ever saw of John was his big toe. <laughs> okay. But but what I remember about about his character Oliver was that you know he was a very good beaver jr if you will he he played you know beaver had two sons you know kip and oliver and and oliver was of a good a good parallel to what beaver was i i really i really enjoyed oliver's character it was he he did a phenomenal job with that i think i've watched every episode of the new leave to beaver at some point in my life uh and i don't remember the shows like you do certainly but the one scene that i do remember very vividly is Kelly on the bathroom counter taking off Oliver's braces. And just the pain I thought that had to be. And we're going to talk to him about that uh, little scene today. Yeah. All right, so let's get going. It's our celebrity interview for the week with John Snee. And then stay tuned after that for this week's podcast plug. John Snee, welcome to Fan Counters. We're so glad that you're finally joining us here. How are you? Well, thank you, uh, Nick. Thank you, Brian. I'm well. Um, thank you for having me on. Uh, I apologize for the delay in uh, in connecting with you guys. Um, I'm so bad at uh, I think Facebook is it Facebook Messenger uh-huh. yeah. uh, that, that that a lot of people use to uh, to communicate. But uh, anyway, um, thank you for having me. You bet. Now it's really funny, I, and I'm going to ask you this question, kind of tongue in cheek. Have you heard any of your other fellow cast members uh, talk on the show yet? 
You know, I have, and I want to thank you guys because uh, this has really been such a fun trip down memory lane. Um, I've listened to the interview with Kalina uh, and with Kip and with uh, uh, Christian and Eric, Mm -hmm. and I listened to the the, uh, talk with Brian Levant. And, uh, you know, they, they've all, uh, well, with, with the exception of Christian, um, they, they've all kind of stayed, um, uh, in, in that industry, you know, Kip for a number of years. I know now he's, uh, he's doing uh, something over at Amazon. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I went off and, uh, you know, I left the industry, uh, shortly after, uh, the, the show ended, um, and went on to do different things. So, you know, with life, life gets so busy with family and with work and, it just it, it's such a blast from the past. So thank you for uh, for putting all that together and for doing these interviews. I've really enjoyed uh, uh, reminiscing um, by listening to uh, to all those uh, interviews. It's really funny. You were kind of the lone holdout that we were really looking forward to getting on the show because, and I thought Kalina was going to be the hardest one to get on the show, but we couldn't find your info. And Brian Levant's like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get this for you. And then Eric's like, yeah, I'll I'll send a message out to him. And I'm like, why isn't John contacting us? Like, is it us? Did we do a bad job? But um, you are here and we're just very thankful for that. Before we get to you playing Oliver on the new Leave it to Beaver, I want to talk about your experience being a child star that's what I'm really interested in, and I hear a lot of great stories on this podcast. I bring in former child stars, and I just love hearing, because like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a star. So looking back, what thoughts or opinions did you have about you know, growing up on television? Just, you, know, you were with your peers, but you're also in front of America growing up. So did you ever consider yourself to be a star? Well, you know, anytime I did start to think of myself as a star, my parents quickly reminded me, that I was, you know, one of uh, of four children, and that there was nothing um, special about me just because I happened to be on, you know, to do commercials or do some TV shows, because at that age, at least for me, um, you know, being eight, nine, ten years old, um, you're not. I wasn't really well grounded um, in terms of um, my own identity because I, I think I had spent. So much time, um, you know, going on interviews and and doing commercial shoots when I was younger. Um, so it, it really helped having uh, two parents that really helped kind of keep me centered. And um, th- I guess the, the most uh, one of the more interesting things would have been the experiences in school. You know, because you, you, you'd leave school to go um, shoot a commercial or or do a, a, a spot on a show or, or even for longer periods of time. When I was on the was when I was on Beaver, mm-hmm. you, you know, and the kids would would be like, well, where where are you going? What are you doing? And you know, you'd say, I'm I'm going to do this show, and uh, and they would they would have all these questions for you, and ask about who you, who you're acting with and what you're doing, and uh, one of the things that always irked them the most was when they would find out that you that I only had to do three hours of school a day on the set, <laughs> and you know, of course, when you're in school, you know, you're there for six uh, seven hours, and so that that really kind of annoyed my friends. But, um, yeah, as far as feeling like a star, I mean, th- th- there were times when, when I had, you know, when, when I recognized that I, I was doing something pretty cool, pretty special, something that not a lot of kids uh, got to do. So, um, yeah, from, from, that, from that aspect, uh, it, it did feel pretty cool. But, again, my, my family always kept me grounded. I'm going to jump in with one more question before Brian starts with the, the beaver stuff. Uh, three months before you would make your debut as Beaver Cleaver's son, Oliver, in that CBS movie, uh, Still the Beaver, you appeared for a quick minute with Valerie Bertinelli in a made-for-TV movie. It was called I Was a Mail Order War Bride, and you were just seven or eight years old at the time. What do you remember about your start in acting for television? Well, I have memories of different shows, uh, different spots I did. Um, and you know, whenever I would get the chance to, uh, appear on a, on a show with someone like Valerie Bertinelli, who, you know, was just beautiful and she was kind of, kind of a heartthrob back then, it would always be interesting to hear the adults in my life react when they would hear that I would be, um, on shows with different uh, people like that. And they'd kind of be like, wow, you, you know, tell her I said hi, or can you get, can you get, get an <laughs> autograph for me? And, you know, I'm, you know, seven or eight years old. I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and I didn't fully appreciate the gravity of, of everything that was going on, but my parents would use use uh, th- these opportunities every once in a while um, to uh, I don't know to kind of uh, play jokes on their their friends or family. I remember one time I did a a commercial for Legs Pantyhose. I played this little kid, and I was in the commercial with um, 
with Barbara Eden. And my grandpa was a huge, you know, he, he was head over heels for Barbara Eden. Mm -hmm. And so my, my dad uh, told me uh, after the shoot <laughs> to go up to my grandpa when he came out to visit and, and say, now, make, John, make sure you tell uh, grandpa that Barbara Eden uh, asked about you. So I did. And, you know, that, that, you know, that got a big laugh. And, uh, <laughs> and that, that was uh, it was always fun to, to pull pranks like that. All right. Let's talk Beaver now. So what brought you to the auditions? You, you did the CBS movie of the week first. What, what had you auditioned for that part? So at that uh, point in my life, I, I was, it, it all is such a blur. Um, I was going on so many auditions. You know, you know, whenever I would get home from school in the afternoon, it was probably at least once or twice a week, uh, sometimes three times a week that my mom would say, um, you know, okay, uh, I've, I've packed your snack, uh, get in the car, we're, we're driving down to Hollywood, you have an audition. And sometimes I would, you know, my reaction would be, oh, come on, you know, I just got home from school <laughs> and uh, I want to play. And she would say, okay, well, listen, I've, we've had this talk before. Uh, I'll call the agent right now and I'll tell, I'll tell the agent that you're not interested in doing this anymore. And then I would always relent and say, okay, no, no, I really like doing this. So come on, let's go. So I, I honestly, I don't remember the first audition specifically for, uh, for the still the beaver, um, m movie of the week. But I do remember when, when, uh, I was, I was told by my mom that, that I had uh, booked the part and I was very excited because I had watched, uh, the, the beaver, uh, reruns. Uh, the Leave It to Beaver reruns. And so the idea of getting to actually meet Jerry and Tony and Barbara and Ken, I just remember that being a, a super cool feeling and a super cool experience. And I remember um, uh, meeting with them uh, the first time, um, you know, when we had our first cast meeting. And it was just, I, I was so starstruck. It was so cool. And my parents too, you know, because they, mm -hmm. they grew up watching the show, um, you know, when it was on live. And so it, it was just a really big, cool experience for, for my whole family. When we talked to Jerry, he mentions that many times when kids go back and watch the original Leave it to Beaver show and they see him as a little boy and then their parents might be like, well, you're going to meet Jerry Mathers. And then they get there and they think that they're going to be meeting a little kid. Did you have that? <laughs> Did you know he was going to be grown up? Were you surprised? Like, wait a minute, that doesn't match up. It's interesting you say that. I, I do distinctly re remember that walking walking into the room, where and Jerry's sitting there, and I was kind of confused. I was like, "Wait, that's that's not Beaver, you know? That, that's a grown man." And you know, but it, it quickly I quickly realized, "Oh yeah, okay. Well, he, he's he's older now." So, he grew up. but yeah, that is funny. <laughs> so Oliver's best friend was Duffy. He was played by Giovanni Rabitzi, which which he went by Vani at the time. Are you still in contact with him? And what kind of chemistry did you have? You know, um, uh, I knew him as Vani back then, and he was just a, a cool kid. Uh, we we did have a lot in common. We were the same. We were the same age, and um, I don't remember this specifically, but um, I, I remember being told um, that Vani um, and I were going for the same role for, for the for the part of Oliver when they were doing the casting for oh. uh, for the. Uh, for still the beaver when it when it was made as a tv series on, on the disney channel oh, cool. and so um yeah so and then so he was in um i'm pretty sure it was the first season and um anyway anyway we hit it off right away um I, in fact i even remember having um sleepovers a couple of times at his house and i remember uh his whole family was was really nice he had a twin sister has a twin sister uh marissa and he had a, yo a younger sister um, and I remember his mom and, and dad, and it was just, uh, you know, he was a cool kid. I remember we would goof around on set and uh, we, we would play, uh, we would play di different games over his house, uh, cops and robbers and things like that. But, you know, after the series ended, um, no, I really have not uh, kept in contact with, uh, with Giovanni. I, I know I, I enjoy watching his work. Uh, he's a, he's a phenomenal actor, um, you know, saving private Ryan and, uh, and all the other stuff that he did. But uh, no, we, we really have not kept contact. So you, you appeared in an episode of the wonder years. Did he, you know, he was a, you know, re he had a regular part on that show. Did your connection with him, did, was that, was there any influence in you getting that part there? Not that I'm aware of. No. In fact, that was a very quick, uh, uh, shoot that we did. I, I think it was just one afternoon and I was in a, I was, it was a, 
it was a pretty quick quick role in a scene in, in a in a classroom. Um, but no, I, I did not run into run into Vani to Giovanni uh, when I was there on the set. Um, but who knows? He might have pulled some strings uh, behind the scenes to get me on there. And uh, if he if if you did, uh, Giovanni, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about that pilot episode because Corey Feldman played your older brother in that movie, Still the Beaver. And once the show was picked up as a series, Kip Marcus, obviously, is that's who we know as Kip in the show. He took over the older brother role. Realizing that you were only eight years old when you were working with Corey, do you have any memories of what it was like to work with him? And were you guys friends on the set? We were friends on the set. Yeah, I have I have memories of uh, of uh, hanging out with Corey. And, you know, I remember, uh, oh, gosh, I was, uh, I think, uh, seven or eight years old. So Corey was a few years older than me. And I remember he was a big Rodney Dangerfield fan, and he uh, loved to tell Rodney jokes, and <laughs> um, and he would always crack everybody up. And my, my father, uh, Dennis Snee, he was a comedy writer and uh, had a very long and successful career in Hollywood, wrote for The Tonight Show. Uh, he wrote a, a lot of jokes for Rodney, and I remember my dad uh, getting a real big kick out of uh, hearing Corey uh, tell Rodney jokes. Um, and then I know, uh, uh, Corey was also a big Michael Jackson fan. And so he would uh, be doing his break dancing stuff or his moonwalk stuff. Um, you know, it's funny when, when you are on uh, set, uh, as a kid and your, your co-star is, um, is older than you, you know, you, that can be a, a recipe for disaster for, you know, at least from your parents' perspective, because, um, you know, I was the oldest kid in my family, um, uh, so I was kind of the influencer on my my younger siblings, but then I went into a role on Beaver where I had an older brother, and so you know all of a sudden I'm I'm, I'm getting influenced by this this older uh, boy, and so my parents would try to you know say hey we're not we're not sure you guys should be hanging out together you guys are going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I remember my, my, my one time Corey talked me into rolling we were out shooting a a, a, a scene somewhere. Uh, on location, and Corey convinced me to roll down uh, this grass hill, uh, <laughs> and so I, I did it. My mom was so mad at me because my my wardrobe got all grass stained <gasps> and everything. Oh, yeah. and no like, way! You know, if you keep this up, we're not going to let you hang out with Corey anymore. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we all, we had a real good time. You know, last night on Facebook, I quickly put a post up and I said, "Hey, we we finally have John Snee. We're going to interview him." So I do have some comments that I'm going to throw in here randomly from the Facebook family. Um, and Brian Bell says, ask him about Corey Feldman because he was rotten. He says the show would be unwatchable if they hadn't brought in Kit Marcus to replace Corey. So do you know the reason why they actually made that change? I don't. You know, again, I was so young at the time. I, I remember uh, hearing that that, uh, that they were bringing uh, the, the, um, Still the Beaver. They were going to you know, run it as a series after the movie of the week. And uh, I, in fact, I remember uh, my best friend at the time who lived across the street from me it was his dad who said, hey, John, have you heard they're, they're going to uh, they're going to bring back that show as a series that you were on that's still the beaver. And that was the first I heard about it. I'm like, hmm. wow, that's interesting. And so then I, I learned that there would be auditions and I would have to go in and read. Um, but yeah, then shortly thereafter, I heard uh, that Corey was not going to be involved. And I remember thinking, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, he was my brother on the show. I don't know. I don't know how how the show can go on if if Corey's not there. Yeah. Um, you know, I as far as like um, you know any p problems or behavioral issues, I, I'm not aware of anything like that. I just figured it had to do with you know, you know contract stuff. You know, stuff that was above my head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, there was an episode called "Carried Away." Now, in that episode. Freddie talks you into sitting in a lawn chair and he connects some, some weather balloons that he and Kip are using for some, some school experiments. And you bet him that, you know, you say there's no possible way that these are going to take someone off the ground. Well, he tries to put himself up on the, off the ground and it doesn't work, but he puts you in the chair instead. He bets you a dollar and you lose that dollar. And I'm just wondering you know, at that time you were eight or nine years old. And so how did they make Oliver look like he was up in the sky? Well, when I read that, that script and when I was, when I was told the storyline about me, you know, that I was going to be in this, in this uh, lawn chair attached to balloons, <laughs> I was so excited, excited. I was ecstatic at the prospect <laughs> 
of, uh, you know, flying up into the air attached to these balloons, you know, going, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet in the air. And once, once they explained to me, well, no, John, uh, we're going to have a stunt double uh, who's going to be in the, in the chair uh when it goes up that high. I remember seeing, you know, in the back lot, there was this huge crane that was lifting up this, uh, you know, the chair with the balloons and there was a stunt person in the chair. And I, I I remember being a little miffed that I didn't get to do that. (laughs) And it's a funny thing. Actually, if my, if my memory is correct, um, the, the stunt person that they hired was, was a woman. Uh, and so uh, they put a wig on her and, and she was in, in the chair and I was, you know, kind of missed. Not only am I uh, not able to do this myself, but they're having a girl sit in the chair no. do, you know, do, <laughs> doing this stunt for me. And then get this, um, well, after we went to Florida, uh, years later, um, we're doing an episode, uh, where I'm on a football team. And uh, in the in the in the script, uh, you know, I'm taking some pretty big hits, getting tackled and whatnot. And so Brian Levant says, uh, uh, the the executive producer says, now John, we're going to have to get a stunt double for you for these scenes where you take a hit. And back home, just uh, months earlier, I was on my my high school freshman football team. So I'm thinking, come on, you can't, you got to only take the hits. And so not only do they get a, a stunt man, but again, they hire a stunt woman to take the hits from the other football players. <laughs> oh, so boy. I'm just mortified. <laughs> you know, my friends find out about this and, and I'm the laughing stock of the school. So anyway, yeah, that's my experience with, uh, with, with, uh, stunts. That is crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is where, where it's going to get, uh, very interesting for the listeners and very awkward for you. I'm sorry, John. Um, because okay. with Kalina and, and Eric, we talked about on screen kisses and you did have a couple of those on screen kisses first in the episode, Plenty of Fish in the Sea, where you and Kip double date with some sisters. You go to a movie theater, and you get to to kiss in the movie theater. And then uh, in the episode First Base, where Kelly has a boy-girl party, and you play Spin the Bottle, uh, that was another time. So what was it like for you to go through these kisses knowing that there's cameras and crew and like 30 people around you? It was terrifying. Um <laughs> My my first uh, screen kiss was, you know, I hadn't had my first real kiss yet, so I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, and my, my biggest fear was that, uh, the, that the actress that I had to kiss was going to be, uh, you know, so turned off at the prospect uh, that, she would, that she would back out at the last minute. So thankfully, uh, that didn't happen. But I do remember for the, the scene on the double date with Kip, um, uh, uh, where I, I have to, where I get to kiss this this girl that I'm on the date with, uh, we, we're doing the read through on that Monday morning, and uh, and then it's time to go to rehearsal. And I realized to my horror uh, that I have to put my arm around this girl, and I didn't put uh, deodorant on uh, <gasps> that morning. Oops. And I'm like like 12 or 13 years old, and you know a boy at 12 or 13 years old, you know you start <laughs> to get body odor, and so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I, I convinced one of the uh, transportation guys to drive me uh, back to the soundstage and, and, and where in the bathroom um, uh, on the set, uh, the, the boys' bathroom at the Cleaver House, there are cans of deodorant. So I go run inside and I put the deodorant on and then we go back and, 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 do, the, and do the rehearsal. But yeah, at that age, I, I, I was just terrified at the prospect of having B.O. or this girl not wanting to kiss me. But in, in the end, it, it all worked out fine. So that movie theater one, was that your first kiss? Um, I'm trying to remember if that was the first kiss or if it was the spin the bottle game. Um, whichever one it was, I, I remember that, that being the, you know, my first kiss in real life, too. Now, fans want to know if you had a crush on Kalina Kiff. You know, I did not. Um, Kalina and I were um, were very close. We were we were at odds a lot. Um, we I mean, we really had that kind of brother sister relationship. Um, I, I've always really um, you know adored uh, Kalina and my relationship with her. Um, we when we went to Florida in particular, we we spent a lot of time together um, on set and off set at the apartments where we were living. But uh, no, not, nothing. Uh, I mean, it was always uh, strictly plutonic. You know, I was never her type. Um, you know, and it's funny whenever we would have these guest stars on the show, these you know good-looking kids, these guys. You know, I always knew. Uh, I remember saying, "Now, oh, Kalina, I think you're gonna like, you're gonna like this one." You know, the guy they cast for this role, and I, I usually was able to nail it pretty well. I, I had her type down pretty well. Did you guys ever have any any 
mischievous happenings that ever happened on the set or on the lot or any pranks that you pulled? Yeah, you know, um, it was so awesome being able to work at Universal Studios at that age. Um, and we did a lot of filming in the back lot. And um, I, I knew uh, that there was a lot of history back there. A lot of great productions were done back there, including Leave it to Beaver. Um, and so being in the back lot at Universal, uh, whenever we had downtime and we weren't in school, uh, I remember uh, in particular Eric uh, and uh, Kalina and I, um, we, we used to uh, we used to play uh, hide from uh, the security patrol, and 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 so you had to watch out for the security guards who were driving around. You had to duck into buildings as we're riding <laughs> around on our bikes, and also the trams were you know packed with with people trying to enjoy the park, and these trams are you know you're going in and out of the streets in the back lot. So that was that was a pretty fun experience. I remember at one point. They had a, a little part there in the tour where uh, the, there would be the parting of the Red Sea, and the tram would, would drive through the, the, the parted uh, sea at this lake. And Eric and I try, thought it would be a good idea to try to ride our bikes through where the sea had parted. Uh, just as we turn around the corner, we, we find the tram coming directly at us. So, we bo- uh, so I fall off my bike. I'm dragging the bike behind me, trying to you know, get out of the way, and all these, all these poor tourists are seeing this kid act like a total goofball. <laughs> um, I, rem- I remember one time uh, we were shooting back uh, in the back lot and we had a break and one of the um, one of the crew members was sitting on his chair and he was taking a little nap. So I thought it would be a good idea to uh, fill a, a cup with water and, uh, and and just go ahead and pour it on his on his stomach. <laughs> and he woke up and he chased me around for about five minutes and everybody's yelling, no, you can't touch him. You can't touch him. And this guy, he was so mad at me. Uh, Michael Oripache was his name. <laughs> and he swore he was going to get me back that season. But uh, yeah, he, he never did. So, yeah, we, we, we pulled a lot of pranks and did, did some fun stuff on the back lot. But, you know, uh, when, we, when we went to Florida, um, you know, as, as you know, that was uh, basically a dirt lot. Uh, there were four sound stages. And I remember that there was the Psycho House off in the distance. Well, at that, at that point in time... Um, I think I was 14 and I was able to get my hands on all sorts of fireworks and explosives because we were, we were in Florida. So you're very different from California. Um, you, you know, you could easily get gunpowder, fireworks, anything, pretty much anything you wanted back in the late 1980s. And I remember Christian Osmond and I in particular, um, we used to go back there and light off these rockets and we would make these, these homemade fireworks. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, we thought we were getting away with a fast one because we're out in this dirt field. Nobody knows we're doing this. And then a week later, the security guard comes up to us and says, hey, come take a ride with us. So the security guard takes us to their main little headquarters off, off on the side of the, the studio, the dirt lot. And they show us these, this, these um, cameras that they have. So they've got cameras everywhere, and they've been watching us over time, setting off these basically bombs. <laughs> and uh, so at that with point, bomber. they said, you know, you, you guys have to cool it and knock it off. So we did. Were your parents along for that little conversation or do they just be like, hey, kids, come with us? No, uh, it was crazy how much um, freedom we had there. My, my dad, uh, Dennis, was a writer and, and later producer on the show. Um, so he, um, he and I went to Florida together um, and we, st- we lived in an apartment there for five months. And so you know, my dad was busy writing on the show, so I would get to go off when I wasn't filming or when I wasn't in school. And, and uh, you know, these, my fellow cast members and I would get into these uh, hijinks. And uh, no, my dad was, was none the wiser uh, at the time. Now, I noticed that, uh, I noticed here a, co- you know, a couple of episodes that come to mind. The episodes that your dad wrote, you were the prime focal center point of those episodes. Specifically, like uh, the one with... Um, you get braces, and the one where you're on the football team, which you just mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And I was going to ask about the uh, about the braces episode. That I would imagine you know, you needed braces in real life. That episode starts out with you with no braces, and then later on, you, your the braces are put on. How did they? You know, because Oliver didn't like the fact of of having braces so and you know he had kelly help her try to help him try to remove the braces were those real braces that were being 
removed from your mouth? You had this big bento piece coming out of your mouth. <laughs> no, thank goodness that that was just a you know piece of uh, metal or, or a string or rope or something that they had colored uh, silver. Um, but no, I, I distinctly remember that scene where uh, Kalina has. I think she has. She's sitting on the counter in the bathroom, and she's got a pair of pliers, and she's trying to pull my braces out. Uh, <laughs> so thank goodness, no, those those were not my real braces. But I do, yeah, I remember. You know, it's so funny when you go through these, you know, uh, these milestones in your um, in your juvenile years. You know, whether it's getting braces or going through puberty. Um, you know, so with with the braces, yeah, they they had to write that into the show because I had horribly uh, misaligned teeth. So they knew that the braces were coming. So, um, you know, Brian and, the, and all the writers, they were so good at incorporating whatever was going on in your life at the time into uh, the show. And they would, you know, make it a little storyline in an episode. Um, and speaking of life changes, I remember, you know, we started the series when I was, I think, uh, nine in 1984. And uh, I don't remember if it was the season, uh, one or two seasons after the first season. But I, I came back after the break between seasons and I, I had started going through puberty and my voice had completely changed. And so when I would, you know, come up to people and say, hey, you know, welcome back. Hey, how you doing? People would just start laughing out loud. And I would be <laughs> like, what are you laughing at? And they're like, who, who, who are you? Who is this kid? You know, you're, you, you sound completely different. But again, the, show, the producers and the writers were always so good about, uh, you know, incorporating those changes in real life into the show. We've mentioned him a couple times, so uh, let's pay some homage to your dad. Uh, and I'm very sorry for your loss last year of your dad, Dennis Snee. Um, talk a little bit about to us of, of what that meant to you to be able to be in Florida working with him and spending so much close time on a project you both were very heavily invested in. What was that like? Well, thank you for your kind words. It was a very tough loss. Um, um, yeah, he died uh, last year. Uh, it was tough on all of us, but, uh, yeah, I mean, without my dad and my mom, um, I wouldn't have been on the show. Um, and the, the way, the way that things worked out, it just worked out so beautifully. It was such a blessing. Um, initially when the show started, um, you know, I was not nine, 10 years old and I, I, you know, I can be a jerk at times, uh, you know, no. in, in that position, kind of the center of attention. <laughs> and I remember one time, uh, we were um, we were doing a scene with Ken Osmond uh, and and um, and Eric and and some other cast members, and I remember I was goofing off, um, wasn't paying attention, wasn't doing what I was told. And I remember Ken Ken Osmond walked up to me and he whispered in my ear. He said, uh, "Hey, you're acting like a real jerk. You need to knock it off." And that really snapped me out of it. And, and I was and I was like, "Wow, okay." If, if Ken Osmond is telling me I got to shape up, then mm. I, I better I better shape up. And the same thing with my parents. You know, my, at one point, my my parents were talking to me and they said, "Listen, we're going to take you off the show." I think this might have been after the second season. They said, "We don't we don't like your behavior, and um, we don't like the way that you're you're behaving with your siblings. You're kind of you know kind of kind of letting this get to your head." And I said, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to stay on the show if I can. So my dad had a talk with Brian, and, and my dad, you know, was a comedy writer. And at the time, at that time, Brian told my dad, well, you know, we actually have, uh, we're looking for another writer on the show. And, it, you know, Brian said, you know, to my dad, we're familiar with your, with your material. We think you'd be a good fit. So at that time, they hired my dad, and it was a game changer. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, when I would act up after that, whether it was Kip or Kalina or whoever it was, they would say, you know, John, if you keep this up, I'm going to go have a talk with your father. Mm. And my, you know, my dad was, was uh, right down the street in the writer's bungalow. I was so irritated that they could hold this over my head and I couldn't <laughs> act, you know, act like a jerk. Um, but I, but looking back now, of course, I mean, it, it made all the difference in the world as far as, you know, keeping me on track, keeping me straight. And then same thing in Florida, you know, my dad, it, it was really hard for him to leave, you know, his, his wife and other kids, to me, it was the greatest thing ever because, hey, I didn't have to be around my annoying siblings. Mm. I had all this freedom. Um, but, but yeah, my dad got you know, got to be real close there, and we uh, got, got to do a lot of fun things when we were in Florida. But, yeah, it was great having him kind of keeping, uh, keeping me in line. Speaking of siblings, your younger brother Mark appeared on an episode where uh, the Cleaver family loses Aunt Martha, and Kelly is having a flashback. She's struggling with this and your your younger brother mark appeared as a 
younger Oliver in in a flashback that Kelly was having. So what was it like to work with your brother on the set? And were you able to watch his scenes? How did that work? I, I got a real kick out of seeing him get, get to do that. Um, you know, he was pretty young at the time. I can't remember if he was four or five years old. Um, I, I don't think, I don't know how much of, of, uh, that he was able to absorb, how, you know, what a cool experience that was. Um, I know I later in later years, we talked about that and he, he said he had a good time, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was cool seeing him, uh, you know, dressed up as a young version of me along with, uh, Juanita playing a younger version of Kalina. Um, so yeah, that was cool. I mean, that was one of the great things about that show about the, the new leave it to beaver is it was such a, a family environment. Um, you know, the, you know, again, Brian did such a great job of, uh, of keeping everybody grounded and, um, uh, and by I think by bringing in family members and relatives, uh, that just helped to uh, to solidify that. And I, you know, Mark's portrayal of your younger character it was I mean it was very well done. Like I would actually believe it didn't look like I mean obviously your brothers, but like you know I have I have brothers of my own, and I mean I wouldn't be able to you know pass off as one of them. But yeah, and then the same thing with Juanita. I mean, they both were like younger versions of you. It they sounded like you, and you know, it's just it's it was it was really cool. It worked out well. Yeah, it was it was really cool. Well, all good things have to come to an end, and certainly after uh, a few years, the was it five years, Brian? Four years. Four years. Four seasons. The show did come to an end. Brett Cobero wants to know on Facebook, what was it like working on a show for five, four years and then all of a sudden it's just over? Did you guys think that this the show was going to continue? Were you surprised it was going to, you know, that it got canceled? What were you thinking then? Well, well yeah, when you're on a show for that long, um, you, you know, the cast members and crew members, they become like family because when you're doing the, the filming, I mean, you're spending, you know, eight hours a day with, with all those people and you're spending, so you're spending more time with them than you are with your, with your, you know, your real family back home. So, uh, it, it got to be one of those things where you just kind of get used to it. Um, I mean, you, you don't get me wrong, you know, at the end of every season, at least early, early on at the wrap parties, you were always so, um, you know, um, anxious you, to find out, are we going to get picked up for another season? And then they would announce that at the at the wrap party, and everybody would would cheer and and you know give it give high fives, and it was such a cool experience. Um, and then when we when we heard uh, that, we, that we got uh, signed by uh, WTBS um, by Ted Turner's network uh, for seventy four episodes, uh, that was just just amazing. It was like I remember at the time thinking, "Wow, um, I'm going to be on this show until." Uh, until I'm ready to go off to college. You know, I didn't have a firm, real firm grasp on how the, uh, the, the time span would work at that age. But I just thought it was such a, a, an amazing thing. And, you know, you talk about going through these different life stages um, towards the end of the series. Uh, it was in 1988 when we went to Florida and I was just starting high school. And, you know, the, the saying that the grass is always greener on the other side, I remember at that time thinking, you know, being on the show has been great. Um, but it, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if, if this was the last season, because then I would get to go off and experience high school like a regular kid. Um, you know, you don't know what's going to happen after that. You think, yeah, your future, your future is ahead of you. You don't know, you don't know where it's going to take you. But then of course you look back and you think, wow, that was such an amazing experience with so many amazing people. You know, it, it would have been really cool to have it, kept, you know, to have it, uh, you know, kept going on for another season or two. But uh, but at the time, I remember thinking, okay, yeah, this probably is the the, the natural end um, uh, to to the experience. Oh, absolutely. And you know, we we just we just talked about your dad and his experience. You know, his his involvement in the writing of the show. We're, put your put your writer's hat on, if you would. If if they would bring back the show today, we we know this ain't going to happen, unfortunately. But it would be great if they did. But if they brought it back today, what? what would Oliver be up to? What would the gang of Mayfield be up to today? And who would be living in the 211 Pine Street house? Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think probably Oliver would live there. Um, uh, it probably would be a bachelor's pad. I don't know that Oliver ever would have gotten married. Um, I think, uh, you know, it'd be kind of a party house. Uh, 
uh, kind of take the series off in a in a different uh, <laughs> in a different direction, maybe like a Breaking Bad type uh, uh, endeavor. No, I'm joking. I, I think be careful now because your uncle be was a lawyer. <laughs> he might be a judge back then. <laughs> he might be judge a judge in the new series. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think uh, it definitely would would have, uh, would have stayed in the family. You know, I think uh, a likely scenario is is probably Oliver living there, uh, maybe, maybe with his his wife and kids. Um, maybe Kalina, maybe Kelly and her family live next door. I think that would be a, a nice way to carry things on. There's a lot of episodes that highlight Oliver's interest in dinosaurs. Was that based on your interest in dinosaurs at the time? You know, I think I, I did have a passing interest in dinosaurs. I remember that. I, I, honestly, I, I think it had more to do with Brian um, Levant. I know you uh, you got to speak with him a while ago, and you got to see what what a um, just a, a ball of energy he is. Yeah. He, he's you know he's a, a big kid, right? He Absolutely. and he he had uh, so many cool uh, models and toys and just all sorts of things at his house. Uh, I remember whenever I would go there, just being amazed at all the cool things he had. Um, I don't specifically remember dinosaurs, but uh, it's, it, that seems like something that, uh, that that Brian may have been really interested in when he was younger. Um, but I, I certainly found dinosaurs cool, and that was a very cool episode where where we, we did the dig and, and discovered the dinosaur bone. But uh, <laughs> the swimming pool that must have gotten to be a very very deep pool if you're <laughs> you all of a sudden just, you, yeah. you find a dinosaur bone and then. <laughs> Lo and behold, you're doing you're looking for bones instead of digging a pool. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a pretty uh, fortuitous uh, find. But Brian was a big Flintstones fan. Maybe that was an homage to that. Mm. And he and <laughs> yeah, and he exactly. made Eddie a big Flintstones fan too. Eddie always mentioned the Flintstones. He was always w- mentioning the Flintstones throughout the series. He and Freddie watched a, an episode of the Flintstones at the end of one one show. So yeah, he was always throwing little interests out there. He always, you know, he was a very good homage type person. You know, Doctor Tokar, you know, was the uh, the the uh, doctor from for Mary Ellen, and you know, so he always was very good at throwing little intuits in there. Absolutely, um, yeah. Brian is a very gifted uh, writer and producer, and uh, yeah, and then he got to go on and do. Um and do the Flintstones movie. I'm sure that was just a, a dream come true for him. And uh, I really enjoyed listening to your uh, your interview with Brian where he was talking to you about uh, his ideas for coming up with um, Still the Beaver. Um, that must have been so hard for him to have to rename it because he had had that, that title in mind since he was in, I think he said since he was in junior high school. John, you worked with uh, Heather O'Rourke in a couple episodes, and uh, I always, every time I run into somebody in the industry who's worked with Heather because she left us way before her time, I like to kind of hear any memories that you might have had. She appeared in a couple episodes of the New Leave to Beaver. So, what do you remember about her as a person, and maybe her days on set? What can what stories do you recall? I remember Heather just as being uh, this really sweet, bubbly um, person. And uh, she was so nice. I remember uh, when I remember the distinctly. Uh, it was right. It was before she was on the show for the first time. I remember seeing the trailer in uh, when I was at the movies for Poltergeist Two. And uh, you remember uh, her key line from from that uh, her catchphrase from there. the first one was "They're here." Mm-hmm. And then in in the trailer in the preview to the second movie. Uh, the catchphrase was "They're back," and so um, I was so excited when I heard that she was going to be on the show. And the first day that I met her, she you know came into the classroom where uh, Kalina and I were, and uh, she sat down. And I, I looked at her and I said, "I said, are they back?" And she just looked at me and she said, "Shut up!" and just laughed. <laughs> and then uh, we, we 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 really hit it off um, from there. And I just remember, yeah, we hung out for a bit. Um, you know, I think she was only on for two episodes, so mm-hmm. we didn't we didn't really spend a whole lot of time together. But I do distinctly distinctly remember um, spending some time with her, having conversations with her, and she was just always such a, a sweet person. And yeah, what, I mean, it was just it was such a shock and so heartbreaking when we all learned um, that she had passed at such a young age. Um, yeah, it was so hard for her for her family, I'm sure, and it was just heartbreaking. 
and actually we we spoke to uh Cindy Bagel, a scriptwriter and a producer of the show, and she had informed us that she wasn't actually, you know, she was a, like a late time replacement because they had cast somebody and she didn't work out and then they were able to get her. Wow, I'm going to have to uh, listen to uh, Cindy's uh, interview because that uh, it sounds vaguely familiar, but uh, I'd love to hear more about how that all played out. And, and I asked Kalina the same question. I just get your version. There were stories around there that, that Heather was such a perfectionist on set where, you know, it was annoying to her to have people mess up their lines. And then there was a story going around that online, again, it's online, that the you, you guys as the kids would mess up your lines just to kind of get a reaction. Do you remember anything like that? You know, I, I don't... I don't remember too many specific examples. I remember one time where I had to, uh, one of my lines included the words sheepskin seat covers and I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. Wow. Now we've got enough for the go-kart and maybe even enough for sheepskin, sheep, 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 sheepskin, sheepskin seat cover. Um, I th- we must have done 15 or, or 20 takes. Yeah. Sheepskin seat covers. Try, you know, try saying that fast 20 <laughs> times. Um, I don't remember uh, um, get, you know, her getting annoyed with me in particular. It wouldn't surprise me, though. We, we, did, we did goof around quite a bit. And yeah, she, she was, uh, I do remember her being pretty serious about acting. She took it pretty seriously. John, the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast is well known for its mission of having our guests talk about your weird, scary, or maybe even just fun encounters that you've had with your fans. So growing up kind of in the spotlight, being a kid, you must have had some people that would recognize you and want to talk to you about the show or, or maybe just give you a weird encounter. What stories do you have that you might never forget of meeting your fans? Well, you know, um, because the show was on... Um, uh, TBS after it's, it's run on Disney. Uh, we didn't have a, at, the, at least at the time, it didn't feel like we had a huge, uh, viewership. I mean, I know that this, the show did very well, uh, for cable, but, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it wasn't like I would, I would be walking down the street and, and be instantly recognizable, at least not that I recall. I do remember, uh, that Kip Marcus, you know, he was kind of like a teen heartthrob and I remember being kind of jealous uh, 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 over all the mail, all the fan mail that he would get from, from these girls. I mean, he would have bags of fan mail and, uh, he, he stayed at, at uh, my family's house a couple of times. And I remember on, on a couple of occasions, he would, be, you know, take out some of his fan mail and he would, he would say, Hey, John, look what I got. You know, and he, 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 on some of the envelopes, it would say, uh, SWAC, which was an acronym for sealed with a kiss. Oh. And he'd read these fan letters to me, these girls like fawning over him. And I, you know, the, the best I would get would be the, you know, I mean, I would get letters occasionally, which was always very touching. Um, you know, pe- you know, fans complimenting me on my work, um, that sort of thing. Um, oddly, I remember occasionally uh, other cast members kind of uh, poking fun at me for getting jail mail. I remember every once in a while we, we would, I would get an envelope and on the top you'd see you have this uh, like a prisoner's uh, code number. Oh and I'd be like, oh, that's kind of weird, but... But they were, they, you know, they were still always very nice letters. I, I know uh, Eric mentioned to you the funny story about us in the drive-through at a fast food place in McDonald's uh, in, in Orlando, <laughs> where the the lady who worked there, you know, said, "Hey, aren't you aren't you the kids on the new Leave It to Beaver?" And we said, "Yeah, that's right." And we're expecting her to say, "Oh, that's so cool." Instead, she just said, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> I thought so. She just closed the window. <laughs> and kind of kind of brought us back down to earth. You know, it's like, yeah, well, you know, we're on a show, but. Uh, you know, we're just, we're just regular people. Um, so that was kind of funny. That's awesome. And then you've worked with a lot of iconic actors in your career. Did you ever find yourself to be starstruck around anybody? Yeah. You know, um, one of my, um, favorite experiences that I can recall was being on a, um, uh, it was a movie of the week called, um, Sunset Limousine with, uh, Susan Day and John Ritter. And uh, I remember John Ritter was such a nice man. And uh, I, I remember he was kind of coaching me um, on my lines. And uh, I just remember that he was, uh, it was always so cool to, uh, to work with him. Um, you know, I wasn't really supposed to be watching Three's Company as a kid um, because there was, st- you know, stuff that was a little uh, risque, you know, with the double entendres and things. And so my parents didn't really want us watching it. But every once in a while, 
I would uh, I would sneak uh, the TV on and, and catch a show here or there. So uh, that was pretty cool working with uh, with John Ritter. Um, you know, one of the things about um, uh, being uh, seven or eight years old, um, when you're working with these big celebrities, at least for me, uh, you know, a, a lot of the times I wasn't even really aware. I mean, I would watch the you know movies here and there, but you know, people that later would say, do you, you know, do you realize who you were working with? And I'd be like, well, yeah, he was real nice. And then say, you know, no, this is this person is a major star. And, and so then I'd kind of be like, oh, wow, cool. I'll, I'll have to go, uh, you know, shake his hand. So, um, but yeah, that was fun. The 30th anniversary of the movie Camp Cucamonga was just celebrated. And Carrie Walker is a, a, one of the diehard fans of this group. So she asks questions all the time when we have guests on. And she just wants to know uh, what it was like filming that movie with all the stars and did you, you know, were you, it would, you'd have to be starstruck a little bit then, right? Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. Um, that we did that, I think it was in 1990. Yeah. And, uh, that was shortly after Beaver had ended. Mm -hmm. Um, Roger Duchoni was the director and he had done uh, many, he had directed many episodes of Beaver. Um, but yeah, that's right. So uh, Jaleel White was in that. Chad Allen, Candace Cameron, Jennifer Aniston. Yes, of course. Um, that was before she was on Friends. Um, but yeah, that was a really cool experience. Um, Chad and I really hit it off. He, he's a great guy. Uh, I mean, all of them were very were very sweet people. I remember on one occasion, you know, Jennifer Aniston. You know, I, I had kind of a, a crush on her. Uh, w- at one point. Um, we were all the ca- the cast members were in a shuttle van and we were going out to location and um, she was sitting next to me and she had fallen asleep with her head on my shoulder and we and I was thinking wow this is pretty cool so we had gotten uh, to our destination and everybody gets off the shuttle van except for me and for Jennifer who's asleep on my shoulder <laughs> and she eventually wakes up and looks at me and she says you know, uh, do we need to get off now? And I said, Oh, I, I don't think so. And she <laughs> looks around and everybody's gone. And she looks at me like I'm crazy. And she, she gets off and she leaves the van. And I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I, I did what any uh, red blooded American boy would do. <laughs> and that was the last time Jennifer Aniston ever said anything to John Snee. <laughs> yeah. That's Poor right. guy. That was a, we were done at that point. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, uh, just looking at this cast picture, I mean, so many of these recognizable faces. Jaleel White, Mr. Jefferson, I don't even know his real name, but... Um, Sherman Hensley. Okay, yeah, just a lot of iconic characters in that movie. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, John Ratzenberger from Cheers. Yes, yep, yep. Yeah, that had, that had to be a fun him. time. Oh, man, yeah, that was uh, so cool hearing stories from him about uh, his days on Cheers. Yeah, you're right, that was that was definitely a time when I when I was starstruck. Tell us a little bit about, you You know, we talked in our, our pre-interview a little bit about our children and because there was noise in your end and it's a Saturday, so my kids are bouncing around upstairs too and I made them go read. Uh, so you have five kids, but bring us up to speed. What are you doing today? So I am doing something uh, completely uh, disconnected from anything related to uh, the, the film industry. Um, I am in property management. I've been doing this since uh, 2009. Uh, for homeowners associations, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a fun gig. I uh, get to work in a small family business. Um, it's a dad and his two sons and myself. Um, and I've been friends with these, with these guys since high school. Um, so you get to meet a lot of real nice, interesting people who volunteer to, to, you know, serve on these homeowners boards in their communities. Um, so, so that's, that's interesting. Um, and then family. Yeah. I've been uh, married, uh, uh, geez, 18 years now. And my wife and I have five children, uh, ranging from three years old to uh, to 14 years old. And so uh, my wife homeschools our three oldest, and then uh, the two, the three year old and the four year old, they uh, they go off to preschool three times a week. So as anyone with kids uh, knows, especially in these crazy times, it's it's a juggling act. Mm-hmm. I really uh, applaud my wife for uh, being able to keep everything together here while I'm off at the office. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a handful, and it's interesting times. And what do your kids think about your past childhood growing up and being on television and all that? Do they get a kick out of it? Are they kind of like, dad, you were a nerd or, you know, how did they react when they saw those episodes? (laughs) Well, it's interesting. Um, They, they don't really, I mean, they don't really 
fully grasp it. I don't think certainly the younger ones. Um, now my, my oldest, my oldest uh, son, uh, he's 14. And I remember when he was like nine or 10, he's when he, you know, first kind of took it, took an interest in it. He would you know say, dad, you were on TV. And I would say, yeah. And he would say, um, you know, well, how can I do that? And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it, it is so time consuming and such, um, a, uh, it can be such a challenge for, for families that get their kids into the, into this industry because the, the mom, at least when I was growing up, it was the mom, my mom primarily who would drive us all around Hollywood, um, in the afternoon dealing with rush hour traffic. It was an incredible commitment on, on their part. So, um, you know, it just hasn't, you know, hasn't worked out for, uh, any of my kids to get into the industry, but, um, you know, when they see episodes of Beaver on YouTube, they, they, you know, it holds their interest for a little while. And then it's like, okay, I've, I've got some other stuff I could be doing. I'm going to go play with my toys. Um, so yeah, they're interested, but, but only kind of mildly interested. That's awesome. And you're living in California, I assume. I am. Yep. We live just outside Los Angeles. Um, yeah, lived in, uh, uh Simi Valley, um, okay. for, um, for a long time, uh, moved here. My family moved here in 1980, and then I spent some time away for college. And then, of course, when we lived in Florida for five months. Um, but yeah, this is home. Okay. So have they have they seen the Beaver episodes? Do you, do you have any of those episodes? Yeah. Well, thank you, is, um, Brian. Are you the you're the one who's been posting them on YouTube, right? Uh, Scott Hetrick's been posting those. I post them for him. It's it's his YouTube page, and he's got. Okay. I mean, I've 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 had all those episodes for years. He's got like impeccable quality Beta Max tapes that he has been for the last couple of years putting them to the YouTube to his YouTube page, and yeah. So that's yeah, that's Scott Hetrick, and he's been yeah, he's been posting them onto my page. So yeah. His YouTube channel has it. That is so cool. Yeah. Well, uh, hats off to all you guys. I mean, putting all this stuff together and, you know, holding on to it for so long. And, and yeah, the quality is very good you know, considering it's on uh, old Betamax tapes. Um, so, yeah, we've been watching a couple episodes here and there on, uh, on uh, YouTube, uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, and again, it, it, you know, thank you for doing this because this really had, had prompted me to, uh, kind of go back down memory lane and put on some of those old episodes. And, uh, cause you know, it's been, Oh gosh, we finished in 1989. Um, you know, so it, it, <laughs> life kind of goes on, right. Especially when you leave the industry and go on to do different things and you just, you get so busy with life and with work and with family. Um, so thank you for, uh, for doing this and, uh, help, helping me to relive those, those great, uh, memories. Well, well thanks. it's our pleasure. Thank you for being so open and, and honest. And with all of our questions, some of them even, you know, could be very sensitive. Like, I don't want to talk about that, but you didn't dodge anything. And, uh, you know, that's just the fans just love hearing the cast talk about the show. And, uh, I'm so glad that you were able to join us for that. So thanks for your time today. Well, thank you. And thanks for the fans without the fans, as you know, there would have, there would have been no show. Yeah, that, absolutely. And again, we appreciate your time, John. It was, it's been great. You're welcome. Thank you. My thanks to John Snee for joining us on the show this week. It was hard to track John down, but we finally got him here. Happy we did. And in a couple weeks, we got another surprise for you because we have the last kid uh, from the new Leave it to Beaver joining us. Troy Davidson will be here. We tracked him down and uh, looking forward to talking to Troy. We haven't done that interview yet, but uh, I'm sure uh, he's going to have some stories to tell. He was a really little kid when he was on the show. So we'll see what Troy has to say in a couple weeks. Now, let's get into our next segment. It's a brand new hit. Nothing better than free advertising. Here is this week's podcast plug. All right. Today, we're going to talk about a podcast called Smartless. It's a podcast that features a couple celebrities, because what celebrities don't have a podcast these days, and a guy that nobody's heard of, which is a very interesting uh, combination for a podcast, because I don't understand why Jason Bateman and Will Arnett, who host this podcast, need a guy named Sean Hayes that nobody's heard of. Maybe it's just me, but I've never heard of Sean Hayes. And uh, he does most of the talking, which I I never get why celebrities will have a podcast and let a third guy nobody's ever heard of do all the talking. It's crazy. So anyway, here's how the show opens up. 
Hey, everybody, you're listening to Smartless, hosted by Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, and myself, Sean Hayes. I know, I wish my voice was more masculine, too. This show is about learning through laughter in the brains of people around the world who are far smarter than us three idiots. And each week, one of us brings on a guest who the other two don't know about. So with that, let's jump into the Smartless rocket ship and let's blast off into the universe together. Oh, boy. And then he talks about how he's turning himself on. So let's go on to the show. Uh, this podcast has only been around since uh, September. Oh, boy. Let's look. I should have had this ready, right? No, actually, they launched the show July 20th with my favorite person in the whole entire world, Dax Shepard. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ugh. We might have to dissect that episode, actually, in a different show. Because today I just got introduced to this podcast, but in their first few shows, let, let me just tell you, since July, I know I'm, I sound jealous, I get it. Uh, since July 20th, this show has had over 9,000 people review it on Apple Podcasts. I'm not even sure how you get that many listeners right off the bat. Still trying to figure that out. Dax Shepard was a guest. Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm not really sure who that is. Uh, Melissa McCarthy, Seth Rogen, Kamala Harris, uh, Will Farrell, Robert Downey Jr., Maya Rudolph, Jimmy Kimmel, Jennifer Aniston, and Clayton Kershaw have been their guests, and some guy named Gustavo Dudamel. No, no idea. Um, so anyway, they've had some major A-list celebrities on this show. But why wouldn't you be able to get an A-list celebrity when you're Jason Bateman and Will Arnett? For Pete's sakes, there's a lot of fake laughter on this show to jokes that are not very funny like this. I worry about Amanda. I sometimes feel like what's going to end up taking her life is she's going to one time just roll her eyes into the back of her head and they're never going to come back. <laughs> she's gonna, it's going to be an eye rolling incident. And that's what's going to finally take her. Uh, Did you hear that? Oh, that means it wasn't really funny, but we're pumping this up so that it sounds funny, but we all know it's not. Uh, here's the other thing. I often give crap to celebrities who host podcasts because they're talking to their own celebrity friends and it's this little click that where they're letting us in on how lucky for us. I also give celebrities a lot of crap because they'll host a podcast and they'll bring their friends on. I mean, I, Jennifer Aniston just didn't return my call to come on the show, but uh, she's on this podcast and they don't even know what to ask her because it's like this click that they have and they're kind of letting us listen to their friendly conversation. But that's what I love about doing Fan Counters is I'm just a fan. I don't have any celebrity friends, but the celebrities we bring in, we get real questions to them and we really get to find out what it's like to be them. But they don't even know what to ask Jennifer Aniston. Guys, we have Jennifer Aniston. Come on now. Know, let's tighten it up. I mean, All right, listen. Really now, let me tell you what Wikipedia what? has yielded oh. here. Hold on, hold oh. on. <laughs> First of all, they're going to use Wikipedia to find content to ask Jennifer Aniston. Oh. Hmm. Anyway, okay. Sorry, carry on. I, I want to know what you're eating. What is that right there? It's Jason Bateman's favorite. It's a <gasps> is chopped, that the chopped? Oh salad. my god! Oh, that's yeah, so nice. It so might good. have some feta cheese in there. You got the chicken in that? Oh yeah. Yeah, and the Aniston dressing. Yeah. God, it's so good. Got it all, babe. By the way, every time I've been to your house, you're eating a chopped salad. Again, it's just celebrities chatting back and forth about nonsense. Hi, Sean. Hi, honey. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, I'm trying to pretend like I'm trying to pretend I'm the listener and I don't know you. Like, what would I ask you if we, right? I know. And so when Something I'm over interesting. your house, there's, it's so warm and friendly and it feels like home. And that sounds really cheesy to say it, but it feels like. Yeah, this is, it's so easy. Like you live there. Yeah, absolutely. I could totally live there. Yeah. So. Oh, just get to the question already. See, that's the problem. He's trying to think of himself as a fan and what he would ask. And that is not the interesting question. Because either you know some inside stuff and you could pull the scoop out of her. You can get her to tell us something that you know that she knows, that she knows that you know, to let the listeners get a little sneak peek into a fun story. Or you could do what I'm doing and just be, be like, what is it like to be Jennifer Aniston? Can you walk into a grocery store and not get harassed? Those are the things that I want to know. I want to know, like, when you have gatherings like that, is, is that fulfill something in you that you, like, because you don't have kids, I don't have kids. It's like, because I do that too sometimes. I love to entertain, yes. Mm -hmm. 
and I love to light fires yeah, yeah, whilst yeah. entertaining. You're being very modest. And Sean is making a point, which Jason will concur with, because he spends even more time there with with you. But I've spent a lot of time at your house as well. Mm-hmm. You're very warm, yeah. uh, and you do love to entertain. You love having people over. And you're very maternal. You're like instinctually yeah. maternal. And your friends are like family, and yes. you have a lot of parties around, a lot of holidays, and you get a lot of people yes. together. Oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore. Um, because that's... Mm. I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. They're just gabbing about their friendship and how they go over to each other's houses and have dinner. This is not an interesting conversation. We're not revealing anything shocking. I don't know. They do have my arch nemesis, Dax Shepard, on the show. So I, mm, yeah. Oh, did I, I already did that bit. Um, we're going to talk more about this episode when I can pull real clips and actually get dive into it. And I'm going to do that on a future episode because I have a guest with me coming up that I think would be perfect to dive into this. And uh, we're going to do that on a future episode. But anyway, that podcast, by the way, is called Smartless. And you can get it on Apple Podcasts. And if you don't want to be one of their 9,000 review people, you can be one of mine. And I would really appreciate it. So your homework this week is to tell a friend, get them to review us on Apple Podcasts, And until then, stay safe and healthy. Think of us often. Mention us often. Every day, you can make a post about fan counters. And uh, it goes a long way here in, um, you know, my world. So thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us for this ride. We are back next week with another celebrity guest who is very busy filming movies in Canada. Yes, they're back in production. She's going to tell us what that's like and much much more so i'm not going to tell you who it is but it is a celebrity guest she is an actress and uh she's on next week's show so come back for some more fun and do your homework and we'll see you here next week bye-bye